Hello, good afternoon from uh, from Geneva. Welcome uh, to um, to you all to the fifth uh, webinar on uh, WTO World Trade Report 2022 webinar series on trade and climate change. Uh, this is a webinar series organized by the WTO Economic Research and Statistics Division in collaboration with the Trade and Environment Division of the WTO, and it is related to our forthcoming World Trade Report. Uh, the World Trade Report is the WTO annual flagship publication, and each year it analyzes in depth a specific trade-related uh, topic uh, that is uh, politically relevant. And this year, the report will focus on, on trade and climate change. The objective of today's seminar is uh, to understand the role of international trade in adaptation to climate change. Now, uh, this is the first uh, seminar on adaptation. The previous four seminars focused on, on, uh, on mitigation, uh, but they can play an important role, uh, not only in mitigation by helping to reduce uh, emission, but also in adaptation, because uh, somehow it can help to reduce the costs of the adverse effect of climate change. We can all see this, for example, when a country suffers from a drought or a flooding, the, uh, the become increasingly becoming frequent and more intense with climate change, the imports of food, for example, can help alleviating food uh, shortages in the affected countries. But the role of trade goes beyond this, and uh, uh, our two speakers today will uh, tell us more about this. We are fortunate today to have with us two highly distinguished experts on climate change and adaptation, Professor Klaus Desmet and, and Katie Harris. Before turning the floor to them, let me just give you a few details about the logistics. Each speaker will deliver 15, 20 minutes presentation, and, uh, and then I will open the floor for questions and, uh, and comments to the audience. Uh, and I will sort of compile the questions from the chat box. So please write your question in, in the chat box. Without further ado, I invite Professor Klaus uh, Desmet uh, to take uh, uh, to take the floor. Professor uh, Desmet is professor of economics at uh, Southern Methodist University. He's also a research fellow at CPR and research research associate at NBR. He holds a PhD in economics from Stanford University. Professor Desmet, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you, uh, thank you, Roberta, for this uh, kind, uh, kind invitation. Um, I uh, will now share my uh, screen um, so we can get started. Uh, let's go back. Okay, so uh, I will be, uh, I'll be talking about uh, the role of uh, trade as an as an adaptation mechanism to uh, to climate change. Uh, I've been working in this uh, area for for a number of years now. Uh, the paper or the work I'm going to be uh, presenting here today is uh, joint work with uh, with Bruno Conte, who's at the University of Bologna, uh, David Nagy, who's at uh, Cray in in Barcelona, and Esteban uh, Rossi Hansberg, who is um, at the University of Chicago. Um, so um, the starting point. Uh, uh, of, of our research is the observation that uh, the impact of, uh, of global warming uh, depends uh, very much on where you are, right? So uh, there's large, as we know, there's large temperature uh, differences across space, across latitudes. And so uh, when, the, when the world warms up, uh, that is going to create uh, losers and winners. Right. So if you think of the equatorial latitudes, for example, that are already very warm, uh, they will become uh, maybe uh, too hot uh, uh, as a place to live and produce, whereas more northern latitudes or even more southern latitudes further away from the equator uh, will, become, uh, will become better places to, uh, to live and produce. Um, so that's the first observation. It depends on where you are. It obviously also depends on what you do. Right. So some sectors such as uh, agriculture um, are very sensitive uh, to climate. Right. And so uh, have two pictures here. You think about Alaska and, and, and uh, uh, places closer to uh, 
to the equator, uh, they, they, they're sensitive to, to temperature changes. In one case, uh, an increase in temperature may actually increase uh, agricultural yields. In another case, it will, uh, it will decrease uh, agricultural yields. Now, if you compare agriculture, say, to, um, to uh, uh, the service sector, well, the service sector is less sensitive. Uh, to uh, to temperature so uh, you know if you uh, if you work in the casinos of of las vegas or you work in the service industry in dubai uh, these are these are activities that uh, to some extent can thrive in uh, less hospitable uh, uh, in ho less hospitable uh, climate areas or, or temperature zones um, and so uh, if you think of uh, uh, climate change uh, or the impact of climate change differing across um, across uh, space uh, and across sectors uh, from from a trade perspective we can sort of say that global warming is a shock uh, to both comparative uh, and absolute advantage uh, and because of that uh, trade and, and migration uh, we can think of those as being uh, as, as being uh, adaptation uh, adaptation uh, strategies right and so um, if you think of a shock to uh, uh, the geography of comparative advantage you know how do we uh, adapt to such a shock well we, we one way in one way in which we can adapt is by changing uh, specialization patterns and by uh, switching to uh, to other sectors right um, on the other hand there may of course be areas where um, the shock from climate is negative pretty much across the board and so in those places uh, the, you know not only comparative advantage is changing but there's, there's obviously going to be places where um, absolute advantage is going to worsen sort of across uh, across the board and then you say well in those places how uh, uh, would we be able to adapt to uh, to uh, climate shock, well, maybe uh, partly by uh, by migrating, right? So there's going to there's going to be winners and losers across space, but it's also going to be winners and losers across uh, across sectors. And obviously, as we know, as as trade economists, these two adaptation strategies, trade on the one hand and migration on the other, they are not uh, independent, right? Uh, if one strategy is more difficult to pursue. Uh, we may be able to uh, we may be able to pursue a little bit easier the the other strategy. So that's that's kind of the basic uh, starting point here. And so to more fully um, uh, assess uh, these issues, what we've done in our research, we have uh, developed um, a sort of high resolution, multi-sector, uh, dynamic model of the world. Uh, which we call sort of a spatial integrated assessment model, right? So uh, climate scientists and economists who work in, in, in issues of global warming, they work with what is called integrated assessment models that have an economic part to the model and a climate part, and these are integrated. Uh, we're following in that tradition uh, with the difference that we're uh, paying a lot of uh, uh, attention to uh, to spatial heterogeneity, and that's precisely where all these uh, uh, sort of uh, levers of of trade and specialization and migration will play will play an important role. Right, and so it's a, it's a multi-sector, high-resolution uh, dynamic model. It will have trade and migration, and then from the climate side we have temperature on the one hand affecting uh, sectoral productivity but then we also have uh, economic activity affecting climate change right and so there's a there's a sort of a circular uh, causality here where economic activity affects climate change and climate change affects uh, uh, economic activity uh, once we have this model we quantify it at a resolution of one degree by one degree for the entire world economy that gives us 64,800 cells, grid cells for the entire world economy. And then we simulate this model forward for, uh, for 200 years. You can say, well, why 200 years? Well, of course, climate, climate change is a gradual process to see some of its most uh, 
um, pernicious effect, you, you need to kind of look uh, relatively, uh, relatively, relatively far into the future. And then we, we do this to ask or to answer the following questions. You know, how does global warming affect the world's economic geography on the one hand? And then on the other hand, how do uh, trade and migration help humanity uh, mitigate or reduce or uh, adapt to some of the some of the effects of climate change. Um, so the, the, just a few words about the climate part of the model. So on the one hand, economic activity affects global warming, and that is just because production requires energy. Energy uh, generates emissions uh, that adds to the atmospheric stock of carbon, carbon, and that affects temperature. Right, and so. We parameterize the model to a 1,200 uh, gigaton of carbon increase in the stock of carbon uh, by the year 2100, which corresponds uh, in, the, in, in standard modeling by the IPCC to a 3.7 degrees Celsius increase in, in global temperature. That's consistent with the IPCC's, what they call representative concentration pathway uh, 8.5. Uh, so, so all of this just to say that the results that I'm going to show you are based on a relatively pessimistic view of what's going to happen uh, to the climate in the next uh, in the next century. Right? Hopefully, we will not reach 3.7 degrees Celsius increase in, in temperature. So, so, so the IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they use different scenarios. They have sort of a middle of the road scenario and have a more pessimistic scenario, a more optimistic scenario. Uh, the results that I'm going to show you today are for a slightly more uh, pessimistic uh, scenario. And then on the other hand, uh, global warming uh, will, uh, of course, also affect economic productivity. Uh, and there the idea is kind of simple. You know, uh, opt optimal conditions uh, require that it's neither too hot nor too cold. So temperature affects uh, affects productivity, and that relation will depend on the sector, right? And so very briefly here, um, this is um, the way in which uh, temperature in our model affects uh, uh, sectoral productivity. The blue curve is uh, is agriculture, uh, an optimal temperature from agronomy studies of around 20 degrees Celsius, and then a relatively steep uh, decline when you become too hot or when you become too cold. In the case of non-agriculture, non the optimal temperature is slightly lower, uh, but there's also uh, less of a decline. I just, the idea here is that uh, non-agriculture is less sensitive uh, to temperature than, uh, than agriculture. Okay, so let me move a little bit forward in the interest of time here. Uh, um, uh, so, so then we, as I said, we simulate this, this model forward. So let me show you some results. This is uh, what the model predicts in terms of the effect of climate change uh, on real uh, uh, output per capita for the year 2200. So again, no surprise here, right? The warmer places today are the ones that will suffer most uh, and the colder places today are the ones that are going to gain more, right? Because if you're cold and it becomes warmer, uh, that's going to increase your productivity and vice versa if you're already very warm today. So, so you see many places of losses pretty much from the Mediterranean all the way down uh, to the equator and then uh, in, in the southern latitudes as well. Uh, and you see in northern latitudes some gains and higher altitudes you also see some uh, gains in, uh, in GDP per capita. Um, when, we, when we get to uh, the, different, the different sectors here, um this is uh, this is something about you know the way the, the model predicts about agricultural output for the year 2200 um you see in in panel a uh, without climate change you know sub-saharan africa south america brazil india etc uh, etc et important places uh, for agriculture uh, with climate change some of these more equatorial latitudes will be losing and agriculture is going to be shifting more into areas such as Canada, Central Asia, uh, Russia, uh, you know, northern parts of China, uh, etc. That's, that's, that's what the model predicts here. 
Um, you could say, well, what is going to happen then to non-agriculture? Are these um, equatorial latitudes going to become sort of uh, uh, non-agricultural powerhouses, industrial powerhouses? Not quite, right? And the reason is they start off with very low productivity. Uh, the optimal temperature for non-agriculture is, is, is actually... Uh, not not high either and so climate change in some sense climate change is hurting some of these equatorial regions um uh, it's hurting them twice right it's hurting them both in agriculture and non-agriculture and so you could ask yourself well in that case what is this whole story about uh, adaptation uh, through trade uh, which i will get to in a, in a second right but but the point is you know, it's both comparative and absolute advantage, right? So, so trade will help us for sure uh, because there's scope for uh, adaptation through changing local specialization. But that doesn't take away the fact that there will be locations, especially those that are close to the equator, that are going to kind of lose across the board. I mean, their, their, their comparative advantage will, will be adjusting, but their absolute advantage will actually be uh, going down because they will be losing productivity across uh, across different sectors. Um, uh, so let me uh, let me show you uh, something uh, in the last five minutes that I have uh, related to this uh, to the role of trade and related to the role of, uh, of of migration. And so, what I'm showing here in this map is is actually quite important. Um, it shows you. Um, the blue areas, right? The blue areas are places that gain more population in a world with high trade cost compared to a world with low trade costs, right? And so the idea is that if trade costs are high, uh, local adaptation is harder, right? And when that is the case, there's more going to be a push factor to move out of places that are hard hit by climate change, say equatorial, uh, equatorial latitudes, and, and, and people will move, move to more uh, uh, northern latitudes far away from the equator. Right? And so there's this substitution between uh, trade and migration, which, which, which some of us are sort of used to from, from uh, working in the trade literature. But again, the idea is that trade allows us to locally adapt. If we're less able to locally adapt because we live in a world with high trade costs, then uh, migration is gonna start being more of a push factor. And so the red areas, are areas that are losing population in a world with high trade costs uh, and the blue areas are areas that are gaining population in a world with high trade costs compared to a world with low trade costs right and so that's that's an, that's should become part of an important policy discussion here where we really sort of go back to this basic idea that in 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 our fight to adapt to climate change that trade and migration uh, we should think of those as being uh, as being substitutes. Uh, I have a few minutes left. Uh, I, I will be uh, finishing soon here. Um, here is here is another map that may be of interest to you. Um, uh, on on the left, uh, it shows agricultural output uh, predicted sort of by the model agricultural output in the year 2200 in a world with high trade costs. On the right, in panel B same picture but in a world with low trade costs so obviously what you can see is that in a world with high trade costs there's less local adaptation right everybody has to keep doing agriculture right that that's kind of the idea right if if, if there's if there's high trade costs we keep we all need to keep doing kind of everything because trade is is, is expensive and so we we get less uh, we get less uh, local adaptation there's less a role for trade and because of that uh, you know that's what we saw on the previous slide we will uh, get more uh, we will get more uh, uh, migration right uh, for for a given level of of course all of this for a given level of migration costs 
Um, I'm getting here to, to one of my last slides. Uh, what about sort of welfare? What about uh, GDP per capita? Um, what, what, how, how should we dare think about uh, the, role of, uh, the role of trade? And so it turns out that the message here is a little bit more complicated than you might expect. So uh, what you see here in graph A, uh, on the x-axis, we're going from the R2000 to the R2400. Uh, the red curve is, shows you the, 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 effect of, uh, the effect on GDP per capita, so the loss in GDP per capita in a world with high trade costs, and the blue one with a world with low trade costs. And so there's something puzzling here, because in fact, in the early period, low trade costs actually causes more uh, more uh, losses in the long run uh, lower trade costs uh, is actually better uh, you, you get a gain from that compared to to high trade costs so what what exactly is going on here well there are two forces right if if trade costs are low you of course have more scope for a local adaptation right that makes us less vulnerable right it makes us less vulnerable because we can switch into sectors that are less less vulnerable to to to, to climate change that's a good thing we can take advantage of our comparative advantage etc cetera, etc cetera. but then on the other hand with low trade costs you are all also keeping more people in places that are vulnerable and that will become more vulnerable in the future and so so, so there's, there's these two forces that we need to trade off, right? And so the message from the point of view of, of, of trade is, again, trade and migration are substitutes here. Clearly in a world where migration is very restricted, trade has an enormous role to play in terms of adaptation. In a world where people can also move, then, the, then it becomes a bit more complicated because on the one hand, yes, local adaptation, great, but it can also, in some cases, keep too many people in, in places that are going to be very vulnerable to, uh, to climate change in the future. Okay, so let me stop here. Uh, I know we have uh, some other interesting discussions here, and I want to make sure that we have some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Klaus. So the big message being uh, that trade in a world where migration is restricted is very helpful in reducing the costs of, uh, in adaptation, reducing the cost, the negative effect of climate change. So let me give the word now to Katie. Katie Harris will now focus on international cooperation on climate change adaptation. Katie is a senior policy fellow at Stockholm Environment Institute. She is also the director of Adaptation Without Borders. Katie holds a Master in Social Anthropology with Development from the uh, University of uh, Edinburgh. Katie, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to be here today um, and, and just following hot on the heels of a super interesting presentation there. I'm going to be spending the next wee while uh, talking about the role international cooperation and, and in particular international trade cooperation could play in supporting climate change adaptation. Uh, and over the next 20 or so minutes, I'm aiming to convince you all of three key points. Uh, so first of all, uh, that we need to reimagine what we think of as climate risk. Second, that we need to reimagine what we think of as adaptation. And third, that if we accept those new definitions of climate risk and adaptation, that we also need to acknowledge that stronger international cooperation lies at the heart of enhanced global resilience to the impacts of climate change. And we can take a little poll uh, at the end on how well I've managed to convince you all of, uh, of those three points. So first of all then, why do we need to reimagine climate risk? Well, for a long time, those working to understand the risks that climate change could create uh, have commissioned national, uh, in, in the main national vulnerability and risk assessments that aim to assess how climate change will impact a specific place or territory 
and tried to draw out the implications in that same place, for example, for different communities or different sectors. And even though we've come a long way in our understanding of risk, uh, to not only consider exposure to a climate hazard, but also, also uh, socially constructed vulnerability, the focus has been very place-based, what some of my colleagues at SEI uh, call a territorial framing of risk and adaptation. And we've not always found it very easy to assess how these risks from climate change might interact with other sorts of risks, such as geopolitical or financial or trade risks. But the problem with this is that we live in an interconnected world where a threat in one place can easily ripple out to cross continents and countries and continents, to cascade from one sector to another, uh, to disrupt and destabilize global systems and markets. And we've seen that perhaps more clearly than ever with the COVID-19 pandemic. And we're seeing it again as a result of the war in Ukraine. Our lives and our livelihoods are increasingly interdependent on one another, and our understanding of climate risk has to evolve to account for that context. So we're advocating for a much better understanding of what we call cross border and cascading climate risk, how an impact from climate change in one place can affect people's lives and their livelihoods in another, sometimes many thousands of miles away. And trade, including uh, international supply chains uh, and flows of related investments are a key conduit for these sorts of risks. Now the food uh, price crisis back in 2007 to eight uh, provides an example here. So multiple factors, including extreme weather events, uh, rising oil prices, changes in food demand, um, a range of trade policies, and also government responses to the unfolding crisis, such as export bans, all interacted to create a surge in global food prices. This created food insecurity for vulnerable people worldwide. And in Senegal, for example, prices of rice uh, which is a staple crop in the country, rose 200% in, in local markets. So let's take a closer look at how cascading and cross-border climate risks could impact food security and global trade. So last year, some of my colleagues at SEI uh, made a first attempt uh, at assessing climate risk for six of the world's most traded commodities. That's rice, wheat, soy, maize, sugarcane, and coffee. And we took some state-of-the-art trade data, some import dependency data, and predicted changes in yields for our six crops up until the year 2100. Uh, before I show you the results, there's one important thing to note about this study that crop models that exist for these kind of assessments are based on slow onset changes in production. So changes in temperature and rainfall as a result of climate change, for example. They don't account for extreme weather events such as floods or heat waves or risks to transport and processing, which means that it's likely that the disruptions we will face will be even more severe than what we've managed to predict in this study. We saw the impacts of these sorts of extreme events ripple through the global computer chip industry just last year, for instance, when disruptions caused by the pandemic, storms in Texas, uh, wildfires in Japan, challenges in shipping logistics and a surge in demand all came together to, to wreak havoc for a small but crucial part of the global supply chain. Uh, in computer chips uh, that had really dire consequences for wide sectors of the global economy. But anyway, just to take us back to the report. So this graph shows predictions for average changes in yields globally for each crop that we've looked at. And you can see that for five out of our six crops, we're seeing uh, or predicting a decrease in yields globally. Now, given that maize, rice, and wheat play a critical role in achieving food security around the world, 
The report under, underscores that climate change not only creates risks for producing countries, but also for consumers of all kinds, often at significant distances from a commodity's point of origin. These challenges have profound implications for markets, for countries, for companies around the world. For example, in the maize market, climate change could lead to a 45% reduction in US production. Now, such an outcome would likely drive up maize prices worldwide, adversely impacting US producers and the American economy, but also consumers in Jamaica, in Costa Rica and Japan who are highly dependent on US grown maize. Close to 90% of Jamaica's entire maize consumption consists of imports from the US, for example. So our results indicate that climate risks to global food security are disproportionately transmitted from just a small number of countries. So Brazil, uh, the US and China for exports of maize, and you can see uh, Brazil and the US, their risk profiles on the screen here, Thailand and the US for exports of rice and the US again for wheat. For highly embedded products like soy and sugarcane, risk exposure is more dispersed. It originates from many countries. But together, these risks pose a more indirect but nevertheless substantial threat to food security by threatening to drive price increases and shocks across a whole basket of products. So there are economic, social and political implications uh, of these risks, including high potential for increasingly tense geopolitical dynamics as countries and particularly large agricultural producers reckon with their own vulnerability to climate change and strive to maintain their current market shares. So this is why we need to reimagine climate risk recognizing it as global, as systemic, as compound, as cascading, just as the very latest IPCC report acknowledges, and also recognize that responsibility for managing or adapting to these risks not only lies with, for example, environmental ministries, but also with trade departments and with foreign policymakers and with uh, finance ministries too. These sorts of risks for some countries could be much more significant than direct climate risks. So Peter et al in a study from last year found that the economic consequences of cross-border or transboundary climate risk via trade alone are estimated to match or exceed those of domestic climate risks in Germany. And he noted similar findings for Austria and Switzerland. PwC in a 2013 study also inferred that international threats may be of an order of magnitude greater than threats from uh, domestic climate impacts in the UK. But then coming on to my second point, why then do we need to reimagine adaptation in this context? Well, for too long and in too many places, adaptation has been too slow, too small in scale and too incremental. While mitigation is often considered a global problem, adaptation has been considered a local one. And while there are very legitimate reasons why adaptation should be locally led, and I'm not advocating that it should be anything but, it is naive to think that local actors uh, are always equipped with the global outlooks and the global information, never mind the global mandates that they would need to successfully adapt to these sorts of cascading and cross-border climate risks. So we really need a reframing of adaptation as the global challenge that the Paris Agreement first articulated it to be. We also need to rethink our assumptions that adaptation is, is really only the concern of developing countries that are most at risk of experiencing very directly the worst impacts of climate change. So having done the least to cause the climate crisis and with the fewest resources to cope, there is, of course, both a moral case, but also a, a humanitarian responsibility to focus global support and, and global climate finance on adaptation in such countries. But our studies show that all countries will be affected by cascading and cross-border climate risks, irrespective of their location, their level of development uh, and levels of affluence or power. 
and it is in everyone's interest to strengthen the resilience of our global systems to such systemic risks. We also need to recognize that adaptation isn't inherently benign. So just as climate risks can cascade, so too can adaptation responses and create winners and losers. So while an export ban, for example, might be an effective adaptation strategy for a producer country that's experiencing a decline in yields due to climate change, such an approach may redistribute vulnerability rather than reduce it if those reliant on those exports face increased food insecurity as a result. If we are to build effective uh, risk governance rather than generate a propensity propensity for crisis reaction, our current approaches to adaptation that shed very little light on how countries uh, might be exposed to climate risks from abroad and in turn export risks to others require a rethink. And finally, we need to think about adaptation to multiple risks simultaneously. There are at least four or five major interlinked crises facing global governance including war and contested geopolitics, and a looming financial debt crisis, food crisis, and energy crisis, in addition to the climate and biodiversity crisis. We cannot tackle these crises in silos. We need policies that are integrated and coherent in managing these risks, that recognize the trade-offs that will inevitably result, and that build resilience from a systemic perspective. Okay, so now on to my third point, uh, that if we accept these new definitions of climate risk and adaptation, then we also need to acknowledge that stronger international cooperation lies at the heart of enhanced global resilience to climate change. So what's my case for that? Well, there are lots of potential policy responses to managing cascading climate risks to trade and supply chains. An obvious response, if you're a country, might be to or a country or a company might be to source critical raw materials or critical components that could be highly sensitive to climate risk from somewhere less likely to be affected by climate risk so substitute a crop or abandon a supply chain or diversify to weaken import dependency on a single source but this has really important equity implications leaving those that are already facing the direct effects of climate change with the potential loss of their livelihoods as well, a sort of double exposure. And while it may seem obvious in the face of international risks to focus on shortening supply chains and becoming more self-sufficient, to like nearshore and to reshore, this isn't always possible given the limited flexibility of global production and distribution systems and may indeed generate new sorts of risks of a greater order of magnitude than before. Building stock holdings and implementing export restrictions can be a major driver of risk in the entire global trade system, as we saw uh, back in the earlier example of the 2007 to 8 um, food price crisis. So continuing to treat adaptation as a challenge that can be tackled sort of in, an, in isolation through domestic efforts and protectionist measures alone could, could actually threaten to further destabilize international markets, increase the risk of resource scarcity and strain international relations. So in other words, adaptation responses that only account for a very sort of narrow definition of self-interest could undermine global resilience and exacerbate the global adaptation challenge. So in a forthcoming study, one of my colleagues, Frida Lager and others, find that the appropriateness of a policy response to a cascading climate risk to trade will be determined by a number of factors. I'm not going to run through all of them here. They're listed on the screen, um, but you can check out her report when it's, when it's released in the next month or two. But it very much depends, for instance, on uh, the, the sort of the case and the context in question. And the level of embeddedness, for instance, uh, and complexity of products and commodities at risk it depends on trends over time. It depends on risk perceptions and the, the climate risk to opportunity re ratio that, that, that people within that trading system perceive. Uh, it depends on the stickiness of trade relationships and so on. And we are currently trying to explore some of the factors that affect a risk recipient, as we call it, so those that are affected by a cascading climate risk by trade, 
that affect their capability and motivation to respond to a cascading climate risk and how different characteristics of both the systems in which impacts cascade and are transmitted and the characteristics of the recipient in question could affect different response typologies. For instance, determining whether they choose to diversify or intensify uh, production, uh, decrease dependence or enhance cross-border cooperation, uh, whether they plan adaptation or just adopt a laissez-faire approach and so on. But I think the point I want to make here is that there are ultimately there are limits to substitution and diversification and to the flexibility of our supply chains in a stressed system and in a world that is facing accelerating climate change impacts simultaneously in, in different places throughout the world. And while there is significant scope to strengthen supply chain resilience through bilateral trade agreements and sectoral trade agreements, there are risks as well in the complex proliferation of these and in acting as if we can build resilient trade systems in isolation from one another. So I would argue that given our high levels of global interdependence, we need to act together if we are to create systemic and global resilience. And we need a level of international cooperation in adaptation that is currently missing. We need adaptation both at greater scales, greater ambition across the board on adaptation, but also across all scales. So through investments, yes, in local and national resilience building, but also through deploying measures such as regional trade agreements and economic partnership agreements, through new coalitions and alliances built on mutual interests in tackling shared risks, and through investments also in global policy processes, um, such as the global goal and adaptation. And this is not to advocate a very sort of naive uh, version or view of multilateralism that ignores the current geopolitical crises or the fragmented state of global governance, but rather to make the case that effective and just adaptation action could actually incentivize new forms of international cooperation. So importers benefit, for example, when exporters can adapt to the impacts of climate change and sustain their production. And importers will want to see and also consider what they can do to facilitate successful adaptation in other countries, particularly those with which they trade. So in some cases and contexts, this could mean a revaluing of adaptation that leads to a renewal of multilateral cooperation. And such an approach could, could reap really great rewards, given that adaptation investment in one place has the potential to pay double dividends and potentially increase the resilience of groups living sort of many continents, many thousands of miles apart. So just to, just to come to the last couple of slides then. So I'm not a trade policy expert. Um, so when it comes to what needs to happen, I'm, I'm hoping where this is where you can all come in and, and help us figure this out. But from our perspective, we're calling for um, measures such as assessments of cross-border and cascading climate risks in trade and production systems, uh, more coherent climate and trade policy propositions uh, to strengthen adaptation to these risks, greater, a greater sense of risk ownership and adaptation responsibility among those outside what we traditionally think of as the climate community, so including trade policy makers, much more candid and coordinated approaches to adaptation, uh, much make greater cooperation with the private sector to to ensure that we're receiving uh, we're we're strengthening just resilience uh, at both local and global scales, and we're not just redistributing vulnerability across groups. And the international community to be providing the the support that is required for adaptation in countries that lack capacity, and to be coming up with forums and mechanisms and structures for international cooperation to manage these risks. And I just wanted to draw your attention to a couple of really interesting reports that have been released just in the last sort of six months or so that are very relevant to this discussion. The first is by Carolyn Deer Birkbeck from Chatham House, um, who advocates for a couple of different actions that we could take. So first of uh, the first of those being ministerial attention to these topics to trade and the intersections with climate change um, at the uh, at the next WTO ministerial conference, 
uh, and the creation of a trade ministers coalition for cooperation on climate action to serve as a focal point for the top level dialogue uh, that is required. Uh, and the second resource is by Christoph Bellman at the Forum on Trade, Environment and the SDGs, who argues that the multilateral trading system provides a really unique space to advance cooperation uh, at the nexus of trade and climate change. And he says, key to avoiding trade related tensions or constraints on climate action is for governments to understand the climate and trade related challenges that other members face consider the implications of their policies and measures on third parties and identify opportunities to work together. Uh, and just then, if I've managed to convince you of my three points, just then here are three quick projects and resources that you can be engaging with over the next few months. So the first of these is a project that we're involved in at SEI called Cascades, which is a Horizon 2020 research consortium that is looking at cascading climate risks and how they will impact Europe. Uh, and this project includes a work package specifically on trade um, that aims to combine different research approaches to assess climate risk for European trade, supply and value chains. And there's going to be some really interesting case studies coming up uh, on agriculture and critical minerals linked to the energy transition. Uh, secondly, SEI have a number of projects currently ongoing exploring cascading climate risks um, and trade in the Nordic context with a report due out shortly called New Risk Horizons, Sweden's Exposure to Climate Risk by International Trade. And finally, um, SEI was a founding member co-founded Adaptation Without Borders, which is this new global partnership that uh, I coordinate that aims to strengthen international cooperation on adaptation to manage the cross-border and cascading impacts of climate change. And we have a collaboration that is supported by um, the European Commission this year, which has a particular uh, yeah, strand of work on this intersection between climate and trade, and we'll be really interested in working with you all uh, on that over the next year. Uh, I think my time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie, for this uh, very interesting uh, insights. Uh, we have only 10 minutes left, uh, many questions. Um, Klaus has already answered some of the questions, but I think I'll try to summarize uh, uh, and maybe give you the floor with one question each uh, to sort of get a sense of what we, uh, questions we had. So to Klaus, uh, I think most of the questions try to get uh, uh, sort of your insight, deeper insight on who gains and who loses. Are the gainers and losers? Some arguing are the countries that have a uh, high trade costs nowadays, like at least developed countries, going to lose independently of where they are in a way. And um, are the gainers? That's Maybe if you can, uh, you've already answered, I know if you want, want to extend a little bit more on this. And maybe uh, on my side, uh, another question that is uh, in your analysis, uh, you probably don't take into account, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, some of the benefits that can come from a trade like uh, uh, adaptation, the, the possibility of access to adaptation uh, technologies, uh, or uh, to, to say one, or um, reducing pressure for uh, uh, food shortages uh, uh, or more resilient supply chains. Uh, does it mean that uh, somehow what you estimate is a lower bound? And, uh, and to Katie, uh, the Several questions. Uh, one of the questions pointed to the fact that you uh, mentioned the need for information uh, for local authorities. Um, and so the question uh, uh, being, uh, what type of information uh, uh, do local uh, actors need and which international mechanism do you foresee to share that type of, in of information? And then the second question also on uh, regional trade agreements, uh, given that uh, you, sort of, you mentioned the limited uh, benefits of regional trade agreements, but the fact, how that fit with the fact that many regional trade agreements, preferential trade agreements have provisions on uh, environmental, uh, environmental provisions. Okay, Klaus, give you the floor first. Okay, uh, 
Thank you. This was a very stimulating discussion. Thank you also, Cathy, for your uh, presentation and, and for all the questions. Uh, so let me very briefly, you know, answer uh, the two points that uh, that Roberta uh, raised. Um, the one on uh, who gains and, and who loses, uh, clearly um, there's, there's, a, there's an issue that uh, global inequality is, is sort of bound to increase, right? Because it turns out that uh, the most vulnerable uh, places are places that are close to the equator. And those are places that, uh, as we know, are already uh, poorer in general uh, compared to uh, places that are that are that are in more moderate uh, uh, temperature 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 zone so so for sure there's there there are some areas of the, of the world that are uh, very very um, uh, vulnerable and 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 the, and the issue why is it uh, then that difficult for example uh, one of the questions as well uh, for some of these equatorial regions to uh, move into uh, other sectors why don't they become what we call uh, industrial powerhouses well one issue of course is that they're starting off at a relatively low level in terms of uh, non-agriculture productivity and and that um, and that uh, productivity has to be slowly uh, built up uh, over time uh, and it, it's just simply not that easy to do right and so clearly uh, when, when we say there, there's winners and losers, uh, I think that's a, a very reasonable uh, uh, result. Uh, but and, and, and the fact that trade and, and migration can help uh, mitigate some of these effects, can help us adapt uh, to a world with climate change, uh, that doesn't mean, of course, again, that, that there are some areas of the world that are extremely vulnerable because they're vulnerable both in a... In a, in a so they're, they're vulnerable in, in an absolute advantage type type of uh, type of way, right? They're they're kind of losing. Uh, some of these places are losing uh, losing across uh, across the board. Um, so that's one one thing I wanted to mention. And then uh, to to the question that uh, that Roberta uh, uh, raised. Yes, we are looking. Uh, at trade in a sort of a classical way, just sort of looking at uh, differences in, in relative productivity. We do allow, of course, these productivities to change over time and we allow uh, countries to improve productivity over time. So, so you can think of, of our model as being sort of a, a dynamic comparative advantage model where, where you can shift comparative advantage and then you can build on it and, and improve it and, and change it over time. Uh, but we haven't dealt directly with, uh, with for example, uh, adaptation technologies, right? We're, we're more thinking of adapting by shifting, say, out of sectors where you're more vulnerable into sectors where you are uh, uh, less vulnerable. But of course, technology itself within sectors can also uh, help you uh, adapt right and so there, there's ways in which uh, in which uh, uh, technology can 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 help us uh, help us adapt and so in that sense yes it, it's it's uh, we can think of it as being a, a bit of a lower bound uh, and then the, the question about resilient supply chains we are we are looking at we are looking at increases in, in temperature, right? We're looking at global warming. Warming. We haven't looked carefully in this uh, paper at sort of more unpredictable climate risk, right? Uh, sort of more the volatility part and the sudden shocks that you may get in, in different locations. And I think uh, to address that type of uh, uh, climate risk to the extent that, that 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 risk is becoming bigger over time, then he has this whole question of, of, of resilient supply chains and what is the optimal amount of diversification that you would need becomes, uh, becomes very interesting. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. Katie. Yeah, some really great questions. Thank you so much. I, I'll try to be brief as I know we only have a couple of minutes left. Um, so the first question on uh, what what is the sorts of information that local actors would need? Um, so 
I would argue that we're really just at the very beginning um, of trying to understand these sorts of cascading and cross-border climate risks. Um, and certainly some colleagues of mine at SEI and others that we work with in, with, in the Adaptation Without Borders Partnership um, are very excited to be sort of trialing and innovating new methodologies to begin to assess these climate risks, but they really are at that sort of pilot exploratory phase. Um, and I think that uh, if you're, if, if for instance, you're a sort of local adaptation planner um, or you're operating in a local authority or in a municipality, or you're running a kind of adaptation project, it's very hard for you to understand sort of how you are exposed and vulnerable to these sorts of risks at the moment. We don't yet have the enough sort of conceptual development of, of tools and so on to be able to identify these sorts of risks. Um, and, and begin to assess their significance and their magnitude uh, and their knock-on consequences. And we don't really yet have many detailed, even empirical case studies, although they're increasing, around how these risks are impacting um, economies and societies and ecosystems around the world. So this is the sorts of information that I think we need uh, we need to start equipping local actors with uh, and an adaptation should be locally led and it should be locally driven um, but it's very hard to adapt to these these sorts of risks without this sort of information and i think i can foresee all sorts of international mechanisms that could support those efforts particularly under the unfccc and there's a couple of policy processes there under the global stock take and the global goal and adaptation uh, where we could be raising these issues, but also around a number of other areas. And I guess that comes, that brings me on to the next point, uh, which is the great question from Anthony. Um, I'm not a sort of trade expert, so I uh, don't have all the answers to those questions, but this is exactly why we need more forums like this that bring different communities together. And I think one of the things we're really focusing on is the importance of policy coherence. So, so looking sort of across our different uh, outcomes and objectives um, that we would be striving for sort of across different policy domains and making sure that they are coherent with each other. And if, for instance, we're suggesting trade, uh, particular trade policy solutions or climate policy solutions, um, making sure that they don't, uh, that they don't conflict with development goals and, and other uh, interests and objectives that we would have. Um, and this again comes to the point that I think we really need much greater, much bigger community involved in, and seeing it as their responsibility uh, to adapt to climate change than, than just one ministry alone. Um, so that's what I would argue for in that sense so that we can sort of reveal these potential conflicts and tensions and then, uh, and then just have discussions on how to address them. Uh, and then I think there was a final question for me on typologies this is a really interesting one we're in the cascades project we're working at the moment on um uh seeing if we could in in a very theoretical sense develop sort of typologies of cascading climate risks that could then somehow link to typologies of, of adaptation responses to those risks and we're working on a journal article that should be coming out later this year and we look forward to sharing our research with you on that as it develops uh, but of course by all means reach out my email address is is on the SEI website uh, and we'd love to continue the conversations with you on this thank you thank you uh, both we are nearly I mean we are uh, reached uh, it's four o'clock but uh, I was told that we started a little bit late, so we can allow ourselves a few, two, four, few minutes. And I actually ask uh, both of you a question. Uh, Katie, you inspire me with your policy coherence. So what about, uh, on one hand, coherence between trade policy and migration? That's for Klaus. And uh, for Katie, uh, what about coherence between mitigation policy and adaptation policies? Uh, we discuss when you look at there is apparently much more focus on uh, mitigation policies. Is this justified? Do we need to do both quickly because we have just yeah, very very quickly. I mean, it seems to me that uh, the climate uh, the climate crisis is uh, is of such a uh, sort of a, is is so large and so important that 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 the globe uh, needs to uh, will need to pursue uh, 
many different uh, strategies uh, at the same time. So, you know, in, in our work, we, we, we have paid a lot of uh, attention to uh, the possibility of uh, using uh, trade and migration to uh, mitigate uh, some of the impact. And, you know, as, as, as I talked about the sort of substitutability between the two types of policies in a world where maybe if migration restrictions uh, become uh, more stringent, uh, the role of trade will become more important uh, and, and vice versa. Uh, but, but by no means may that be enough, right? And so all the, uh, the, the fact that we emphasize those, uh, those uh, mechanisms doesn't mean that we shouldn't be uh, working on uh, all kinds of other mitigation strategies on international agreements uh, to uh, to reduce uh, green greenhouse gas emissions, etc. I, I, I my sense is that uh, we will need to uh, do and pursue different strategies uh, simultaneously because the way it's looking now, it's unlikely that, for example, only an internet and it, it's it's unlikely that an international agreement, for example, on its own will take care of all the issues. Uh, and so, so that that that's our view, and 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 our attempt of of using these types of models is to be able to think about some of the options that are open to us in in a quantitative sense, right? To sort of say what 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 do I get out of trying to do this? What I, what do I get out of of trying to do that? Uh, today, I haven't really talked about uh, uh, different other other types of policies, but but in related work, you know, we, we are very intensively uh, busy studying what, what could be the role of carbon taxes, uh, uh, you know, in the European Union uh, at a more global level, et cetera, et cetera. And I think all these strategies will have to be pursued uh, uh, most likely at the same time. Maybe just 30 seconds from me to say on, on adaptation and mitigation. Yes. And I mean, I think we see... Um, you know, in, in all of the big agreements that we've had, global, global agreements, including the Paris Agreement on climate change, uh, everybody agrees that adaptation and mitigation should be considered on a par with each other, that, that there is an equal need to consider how we mitigate to climate change and adapt to climate change, just particularly given the, the, the level of warming we're already locked into. Uh, I think where we, uh, we, we sort of fall short, though, when we compare our words to our actions, um, and I think there's a much greater need uh, for adaptation to rise up the political agenda uh, of, of different countries around the world. And I'm hopeful that with Egypt hosting COP27 and saying adaptation will be a priority, then, then we will begin to see that uh, over the next year. But, but also by, by sort of accounting for this international aspects of climate risk and cascading and cross-border climate risks, I would, I would hope that an increasing number of countries see, see it as in their own national interests to, to work internationally, to cooperate with each other, to, to manage these sorts of risks uh, for, for the collective interest. Thank you. Thank you. It, it has been great. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Klaus. Thank you to the audience for the numerous questions and active participation. With this, we close our fifth uh, webinar and uh, see you at the next one. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.